Real stories of werewolves, the dogmen from history, from your emails, illustrated and animated with the democratizing magic of machine learning AI. Welcome to Scary Stories. The Winged Dogman Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have seen a winged dogman behind my friend's house in Kerwinsville, Pennsylvania. I have seen it on three occasions and I will describe each sighting to you. My friend and his family go to Florida at some point most summers, and when they do, I am usually the one who moves in to watch their place when they're gone. For this reason, every time I've seen this monster, I've been alone and there's been no other witness to my personal sightings. That having been said, I am not the only one to have seen it. This creature looks like a werewolf-style dogman, but with a very canine head. He is muscular and his shoulders are broad, like those of a muscular bodybuilder sort of a guy. Its ears go straight up, and with those glowing eyes, you would think you're seeing Batman. And then there are those wings. To me, the wings look too small to actually lift him up off the ground. But this big dogman-type animal has two large bat wings on his back anyway. He can move them. I've seen him gently flap them to clear some fog away one early morning when he was outside, watching some deer that were grazing at the edge of the woods. This was 2018, my first time seeing the creature or entity or whatever it is, and I thought I was seeing a living gargoyle. I mean... What else has a dog head but bat wings? I had gotten up to use the bathroom at 3 or 4 in the morning when I caught sight of the deer outside. Charmed by this sight, I came over and leaned on the windowsill to watch them for a while. Something drew my attention away from the small family of deer to a shadowy area closer to me. Hiding behind my friend's garage was what I at first took to be a large guy dressed up as Batman. As I watched for some time, the part that I thought was his cape moved enough that I could tell they were actually leathery wings, not a leathery cape. He could move those wings at will. They seemed to be a living part of this fellow. The ears on his mask also moved in such a way, but I could tell that was no mask at all. It was a living man-like monster with tall ears and bat wings. And that was what I was looking at. Just then, the family of deer moved and ran off. I looked over at them for a second, then back at the dogman, only to find that he had bolted after them while I was looking away. I couldn't see him any more that night. And in fact, I didn't see that creature any more that summer. I did see it again in the summer of 2019, again when I was back at the house in Kerwinsville, at the edge of the woods. This time it was up on the roof of the house, and I heard it before I saw it. Again, this was something that happened in the middle of the night at three or four or something like that. I was sleeping when I suddenly woke up to the sound of someone stomping around on the roof. I called out, calling him Santa up there and telling him he was months away from Christmas. The stomping continued and I got out of bed since I couldn't sleep through that racket anyway. This time when I ran outside and shone my flashlight up at the roof, I saw the creature for an instant, from the front. I had seen it sort of from the side and rear the first time, but in this second sighting we were both facing each other. He was standing up on the roof, and I was standing down on the ground. I shone my flashlight up there and I saw the creature as it opened its mouth wide and screeched at me. Maybe screech isn't the right word, but it was a loud and angry sound. A second after the light hit it, the monster took off over the top edge of the house and out of my sight. I ran around to the other side of the house, but that was the last I saw of that creature that summer. The most recent sighting I've had was this past summer, 2024. This time it was on the ground, and I got the best idea of how large this thing actually is. In 2022, my friend got a small terrier dog. It yaps a lot, but is basically friendly. One night it was going wild, yapping at something out back, and it wouldn't let me sleep. When I got up to look, I couldn't see anything at all out there. The dog was making a racket, but I couldn't see anything. 
I remember that there are backyard lights which you can turn on from inside the kitchen. So I went and did that, illuminating all of the back area. I got the shock of my life when I saw, standing no more than 15 or 20 feet away from me, this large, furry muscle man of a monster. He was at least six foot six, maybe seven feet tall. He looked like he weighed 300 or 400 pounds, and yet he had those large leathery bat wings on his back. Those wings were big, no doubt, and powerful too. But how powerful would wings need to be to lift a 350 pound monster up off the ground? After our eyes met briefly, the creature ran off at lightning speed into the darkness and was once again out of my sight. Note I said it ran off, not flew off. I can't imagine those wings lifting it off the ground. Nevertheless, that is exactly what my friend claims he saw. Now, I never told him about my creature's sightings until 2022, when I hadn't seen it for a while, and I was hoping it was gone permanently. I didn't want to mention it because I didn't want my friend to think I was crazy. But it turned out, he had seen it too, and his story was wilder than mine. His story starts off with horrible sounds coming from outside. My friend couldn't recognize what those sounds were, but he ran out back to investigate anyway. As he did so, according to his version of events, he saw the bat-winged dogman up in a tree, on a branch, maybe 30 or 40 feet up in the air. My friend gawked as the dogman, carrying some small creature in its mouth, leaped into the air. Rather than crashing down to the ground, the beast took off, flapping its wings furiously, and managed to stay up in the air and maneuver itself out of my friend's sight. So at least according to this friend, those wings actually do work. And this is something I would like to see with my own eyes. But until then, I will have to take my friend's word for it. I don't know if this is a natural creature that lives in Pennsylvania, or if this is some kind of demonic entity conjured up by some kids playing with a Ouija board or some such nonsense. Maybe it walked through a portal, and if so, I wish it would walk right back. As frightening and inexplicable as this beast man is, I admit I would love the chance to once again lay eyes on the winged dog man. The Lady Werewolf Club Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a crazy aunt who tells me stories about her ladies' werewolf club. All the other people her age tell me that she's making those stories up, but she's proven to me that they lie about a number of their own life stories. Still, proving your accusers to be liars is not the same as proving that you actually belong to a werewolf ladies' club. So personally, I would say that the jury is still out on every one of my relatives. Aunt Olsana may be telling the truth or may be part of an entire family of imaginative storytellers. She's promised me that on my 25th birthday, she'll take me to visit the Lady Werewolves and suggest me as a new member. That's still six years away, though, and Auntie O's health has not been well since the pandemic. Even if she's being completely honest, she may not live long enough to prove it to me. You see, they do not accept members younger than 25. This was not always the case if my aunt is to be believed. She says she was a charter member and that none of them were even 20 years old yet when they formed their club. Those first seven years or so were very rough though. And this is why they set the age cutoff at 25. They were of a mind that a woman doesn't really know how to live effectively as a werewolf until she is that age. This opinion was formed entirely based on the fact that these particular ladies got their act together at the age of 25. The stories of the early days of Aunt Olsana's Lady Werewolf Pack sound a bit rough. None of them seem to have had any idea what they were getting involved with as they made the decisions that would carry them on this path for the rest of their lives. It started, as many stories do, with the ladies meeting a man. Or maybe he wasn't entirely a man. And that was the reason the meeting was so significant. There was a werewolf that the ladies met and began to pay attention to. 
Auntie O will only refer to him as the man, or the big man, even as she admits that he was something other than a normal man. Maybe he wasn't actually the big man, but he was most certainly the top dog. So from what I can gather, the ladies met the big man in the 1970s, and they immediately began hanging around with him and traveling with him wherever he went. Antio compared it to Jesus and his disciples, but to me, it sounded more like Manson and his family. According to my aunt, several of the women got pregnant with the top dog's children, and this was before any of them even knew he was a werewolf. Apparently, this guy had such charisma that the women couldn't resist him. My aunt never bore any of his children, but it wasn't for lack of trying. So, when Aunt Ol Sana first told me about the big man, I was under the impression that they all knew he was a werewolf from the word go, and that they were in a werewolf cult of some sort. But it turned out they didn't know anything about his werewolfism for the first three or four months. I asked her why they hung around with him then. What did they talk about, if not werewolfism? Antio says that now, when she looks back on it, she does believe that the top dog used his werewolf charm on the ladies from the very first instant, and that it was even more effective because they didn't even realize they were under his influence. I asked her to explain this more fully, but that part happened many years ago, and she was obviously a bit brainwashed by the guy at that time. She told me that a werewolf is like a vampire in some ways, and one of the ways is that male werewolves are especially charming to human females. That seems like a good shorthand version of an explanation. Now, although the young ladies were traveling around with the big man, we're talking about day trips and weekend getaways at first. When a couple or three of the ladies found out they were bearing the top dog's kids, though, the situation shifted and became significantly more cult-like. It was at this point they all took to the road together in a VW van. I don't know if it reminds me more of Scooby-Doo or of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They would camp out and party at night and then drive to a new party location during the next day. It was also at this point when the big man started to get careless. He had been partying so hard he had stopped noticing the calendar date or the phase of the moon. So one night when they were all enjoying some chicken dogs roasted over an open fire, the big man transformed into a werewolf or a wolfman right in front of the entire group. Antio said that she thought someone had put something psychedelic in their water that night because the first time she saw a werewolf transformation, she absolutely could not believe that it was really happening. All the women were screaming and running in circles, not wanting to be near the horrific event happening in front of them, but also too afraid to run off into the woods alone at night. The big man was their center, their protector, and to see him change into a dangerous monster was more than a little traumatizing. After the change completed, the beast ran off into the woods, leaving the women to their own devices. Some panicked and insisted they all needed to escape while they could, but those few were met with the question of where they should escape to. Again, the big man was their symbol of safety. The other option would mean splitting everyone up and each heading to their own parents and families. And that was not a safe thing to consider doing in the woods in the dark of the night. Instead, the girls decided to huddle together in one tent for warmth and to pray for guidance through this difficult evening. In the morning, when the big man came back to them, once again in his human form, the women were unsurprisingly upset. There was a lot of screaming and a lot of threatening, and the top dog listened to all of it calmly while drinking some coffee. Then, at some point, he rose suddenly, and all the women grew quiet. He was intimidatingly tall even in his human form, and once he stood up, they were all reminded of this fact. Rather than say one single word in response to all of their complaining, the big man put his arm around the woman of his choice, led her to his tent, and there was no more fighting that day. The next part of the story I'd like to tell in Aunt Olsana's own words, 
from a series of emails that she sent me a few years back to answer my questions about those early days. She begins writing about the big man and that human female that he chose on that day. The following is in Auntie O's own words. Those two became a bit of an item. Let's call her Yoko, which was not her real name. Yoko started monopolizing our leader and protector's time. They would always come back with food for the rest of us, but sometimes they would be gone all day. Then one evening, Yoko came back without the big guy. She was in hysterics, saying that he had been taken down by law enforcement. It turns out the two of them had been stealing all our food for months without telling any of us about it. Chicken dogs don't grow on trees, I remember Yoko snarling at us. For a day or two, the group was in limbo. We had lost our leader, and it was his charisma which had held us together. I called my folks and I told them that I wanted to come home. They said no. It was the early 80s by then, and no matter how nostalgic you might be for that time, I am not. My parents were heavy into the Reagan Revolution, which to them meant going to church several times a week and acting superior to everyone else on the planet. Sorry if that doesn't jibe with your memory of that era. My parents said I was a devil child, and that there was no place for me in their home. They said I had chosen to live a life that was not aligned with Jesus Christ, and so I was getting what I deserved. I reminded them that Jesus preached forgiveness, and they hung up on me. So I realized it was either a fight to keep the group together, or go it alone out there in the world. It turned out that a number of the other girls also had families that decided they were too good to take their own prodigal daughters back. And we all sort of gathered around Yoko, since she had at least been the main squeeze of our leader at the end. I think we were waiting for some kind of wisdom from her. But she was just a dumb young woman in love with a dead man, same as the rest of us. And then, one night, we all watched Yoko change. She howled, and she screamed, and her bones cracked and moved under her skin. Her face elongated, and fur grew out of every pore of her body. We all watched as Yoko became a werewolf in front of our eyes. And then, we watched her run off into the darkness. In the morning, we were waiting for her. However she had gotten the werewolf powers, she needed to share them. We demanded she share them. Yoko thought this was all funny. She had no idea any of us would want the werewolf's curse thrust upon us. Since we did, she obliged by biting each of us in turn. We did not become werewolves in the same way the big man had been, at least not at first. He was able to transform at will. Our changes were always based around the moon. When we were young, we would change for three nights in succession, the three nights of the full moon. As we aged, we changed less, but still always on the night of the full moon itself. We would change it to werewolves three nights a month, but we lived as werewolves full time. We took food from other campers. We wore baggy clothing and shoplifted. We hunted while in wolf form. We were off the grid and forgotten by society, so we went ahead and forgot society right back. We were dirty and mean, and we were little more than animals. And then one day, on Yoko's 25th birthday as a matter of fact, we decided to go more legit not go legal or clean up our act in any way. We just all decided that night that a pack of mentally insane women with superhuman wolf powers three nights a month should be making more money than we were making. We felt we should be living more comfortably than we were living. We started to get more serious about crime. We became an organized crime gang. Don't try this at home, kids. We made part of our money working for others. We were great at security and enforcement because... We looked so small. We cleaned up nice in those days and guys liked having us around. But when push came to shove, we could also take any guy down. Even in human form, 
We had instincts and reflexes that no man expects a woman to have. And if we were hired to work on a full moon night, then all bets were off. No man could take us. And no man would ever suspect us either. Soon we went from being dirt poor to living a life of opulence beyond which any of us ever dreamed. This has led me to my life's philosophy, which is... Doing crime isn't such a crime. Doing crime and not getting paid. Now that is a different story altogether. Okay, that's the end of the segment by my aunt. She says that the next phase of their life was a lot of crazy adventures she still can't tell me about. But the pay was much better than in the earlier part of this storyline. Antio does in fact live in a big old Adams Family style mansion. And none of my relatives who say she's a liar can explain how she got that mansion in the first place. She's never been married, so she couldn't have inherited it. Where did the money come from to buy it? My family has no answer. So when Auntie O says she bought it with the ill-gotten gains she had saved up from her life as a werewolf criminal, well, I have to at least consider what she's saying. The tales she tells of this next period are wild as they were able, with their wealth, to find ways to gain greater control over their transformations. Each of them was able to change at will for years, although Antio says that gets much harder to do when you hit your 70s in age. I have to admit I can't wait until I turn 25, and I'm praying for Antio to remain healthy in the meantime. I do so wish to meet any of the other ladies she speaks to me about. One time she laughed and told me that I may have already met some of them, and not even realized it. I have no idea what she meant by that comment. If they really are shapeshifters, though, then maybe some of the dogs I've pet in my lifetime were really my Auntie O's girlfriends. Or what if wolves aren't the only thing they can transform into? Most of the stories I've heard of the werewolf ladies and their rich lifestyles probably might not be very interesting to most of you. They found a way to be both werewolves and civilized at the same time. I know you want stories of the wild nature of werewolves, not the civilized ways of elderly ladies. Mom says Auntie O is coming to Thanksgiving this year, so I'm going to try to get some new werewolf stories out of her. If any of them are good, I'll forward them along to you. Happy Thanksgiving. If you're looking for someone that you can trusty, you couldn't do better than our EP Rusty. Please join me in thanking today's executive producer Rusty Reyes for making this episode possible. By the way Rusty, I think you offered to let me play video games with you at some point in the past and I don't think I responded to that. I don't own any video game systems and that's because I don't have any time to play video games anyhow. I used to have a couple of them on this PC but I deleted them for hard drive space. Making videos and songs is what I really love to do, but I do want to thank you for the offer, which was very nice. It's just not a world that I will ever get to have time to be a part of. I work and sleep, basically. Except when my kitten got injured, then I couldn't work or sleep for a week. I keep promising to show him healed, but he keeps chewing on his injury, and I have to keep bandaging him up again. Here's a cute picture of him that Marie took. You can see the bandages on his arm. His spirit seemed pretty good, but... He is upset at me for making new episodes of the show. He wants me to go back to spending all day with him, making sure he's not ripping his stitches out and all that. At any rate, thank you to Rusty Reyes for being a $10 member. I hope you enjoyed the 5 hour long volume 6 of our members only archive. And I hope you enjoy volume 7 which I am praying I can get out before Monday. Here to explain more about how you can help this channel stay on the air in rough times is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank! Thanks, Biggie, and thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. 
Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.